Lisa. We are civil war musicians and historians from Grand City, Ohio. I have been playing the music and sharing the history of the music of the Civil War for 25 years, Lisa for the last 11. And our programs not only share the music, but they share the history that goes along with the music, the things in the war that would have inspired the songs, stories about the composers and the people that perform. And how do they contact you, or where, uh, they, what's your they website? Contact us. We have a website, steveballcivilwarmusic.com. We are also in Grove City, Ohio. Uh, phone number is 614-440-7581. Perfect. In the summer of 1863, the Confederate Army was running out of everything to wage war. The Union blockade was very, very effective, and of course the southern uh, states did not have a whole lot of uh, industrial uh, development down there. So they were running out of everything. And one of their biggest issues was food. The state of Georgia began shipping large bags of peanuts to the Confederate Army. And one day, two guys ate their lunch, July of 1863, their peanuts from the state of Georgia, and they wrote a song about it. Now down south, peanuts are not called peanuts. Peanuts are called Give it an educated yeah. crowd. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Goober Peas. Goober Peas was written by two soldiers that would become one of the most popular Confederate songs. Today it is considered an American folk song. I'm going to date myself a bit. Back in the 60s when all the teenagers ran out to buy Beatles records, I bought a Burl Lives record. <laughs> <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> I like that record. It had Goober Peas on it. I thought that was absolutely the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. When we come to that part of the record, I picked the arm of the record player up, moving over to the next song. I didn't want to listen to that. I got into this business, believe it or not, 25 years ago. I started playing for reenactments, and I'd be walking along playing my guitar, and somebody'd say, "Play Goober Peas." I think, "Why would you want to hear that?" <laughs> and then I found out it was a really popular Civil War song, and people do like this song. Now, Lisa and I do the Civil War encampment that just took place at the Ohio State House. They do it every year to recognize when Lincoln lay in state in the rotunda at the State House. We were down there six, seven, eight years ago. They brought in 2,000 elementary school kids. And where they unloaded the buses, some smart alley said, go find the old guy with the guitar. He'll teach you Goober Peas. <laughs> we did this song over 60 times. Wow. And I refused to do this thing by myself. So I'd like to welcome our crowd today to the sing-along portion of the program. <laughs> we're gonna teach all you lucky people the course to Goober Peas, and we will lift our voices together and sing. Lisa and I will do the hard part, we'll do the verses, you do the chorus, and we'll sing this thing and get through it together. And I'll do the best I can. So, let's do the chorus a couple of times. I want to warn you eight-year-old kids the second time around. I expect a little letter in the key of A if you want to sing harmony, okay? So, here's the chorus to one of the most outstanding Civil War songs ever written, Goober Peace. Chorus goes, peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. I see people singing. I see some days. The rest of them look stunned. <laughs> One more time, okay? Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Beautiful job, here we go. Eating Goober Peas. This is his favorite verse. 
70,000 combatants, 60,000 casualties. It's fight, fought July 1st through 3rd, 1863. The Union Army emerges victorious. On the 4th of July, Vicksburg, Mississippi fell to Grant and Sherman. They had been laying siege to that city for some plantation. And uh, Henry Clay work went on. He wrote another song in January of 1865, also very popular. It was called Marching Through Georgia. Not a very popular song in Tennessee, but of course it's popular <laughs> up here. Uh, he went on after the Civil War, he wrote a song called Grandfather's Clock that a lot of bluegrass bands do. Very, very popular American folk song. He had a very unsuccessful uh, adult life. He died at the age of 51. This is Kingdom Coming, one of his biggest hits, written in the fall of 1862. <laughs> Thank you. 
Texas, again, one of the most elite Confederate fighting units of the war. They only knew one song. That was a song called The Yellow Rose of Texas. Everywhere they did whack, they sang it over and over and over. It just annoyed everybody with this song. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, this is the song that got me uh, interested in Civil War music. I had a Western trio back in the 90s, and we did a lot of... did a lot of stuff like that. But the Yellow Rose of Texas was on our set list, and one day a lady asked me, she said, who wrote the Yellow Rose of Texas? I said, I have no idea. So I wound up, that time I had a job where I was on the road, and I stopped, stopped in a library up in Northern Ohio. There were six books written about the Yellow Rose of Texas, who she was, who she wasn't, who she might have been, who people think she was. <laughs> but the true story of that was her name was Emily West. And there was a guy who lived in eastern Texas by the name of James Morgan, a very, very wealthy individual, had a huge ranch in eastern Texas. And Morgan was opposed to slavery. So he would go to slave auctions in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. He would buy slaves, take them back to Texas, and indenture them to white families. And the deal was, you serve out your indentured servantship, and in five years you'll have free papers to be a free black in the state of Texas or anywhere else in the United States. And that was how James Morgan freed black people at that time. He bought Emily West at a slave auction. She was 19 years old, very attractive. He indentured her to a family in Galveston, Texas. Santa Ana's army raided Galveston. They kidnapped Emily and took her back across the Rio Grande. At that time, Texas was its own republic and they had their own army, the Texican army. The Texican army chased Santa Ana's army, waited until they took their afternoon siesta or nap. They attacked them, routed them, found Emily and took her back to Galveston. One of the Texas soldiers with the initials JK would write The Yellow Rose of Texas for Emily West. It was published in 1857 as a minstrel song. It was one of the most popular minstrel songs of the 1840s and 1850s. Nobody knows what happened to Emily. She wound up living in New York State. After she became a free black, they don't know what happened to her from there. But this was the marching song or the bivouac song or the only song whose Texans knew. And of course, it was despised by other Confederate soldiers. After Hood's army was destroyed in Franklin, Tennessee, a Georgia boy took, Hood's, uh, took the Yellow Rose of Texas and rewrote the last verse of it for John Bell Hood. So the first two verses we're going to do are the way it was written in 1836. The last verse is written for John Bell Hood. It mentions General Beauregard, General Joseph Johnson, General Robert E. Lee, but it's not very nice, John Bell Hood. So. The Yellow Rose of Texas. There's a yellow rose in Texas that I am going to see. No other soldier knows her, no soldier only me. She cried so when I left her, if I could broke her heart. And if we ever meet again, we never pull apart. She's the sweetest little rosebud the soldier ever knew. Her eyes are bright as diamonds.
that's the memory I have of Whispering Hope. But anyway, this song was a favorite song of uh, Robert E. Lee's, or supposedly it was. That's one of the legends or myths that goes with it. And this is truly an earworm. You'll listen, you'll be hearing this song Monday afternoon, I promise you. So, uh, this is the mocking bird.
cares about the clouds and her together? Just sing a song about the sunny weather. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Now here's the missing verse you never heard on the TV program, okay? You had no idea what you were going to hear if we were still alive. Some trails may be happy. Sang a 
as those we sang upon the old campground. God bless you. And uh, he probably got tired of me asking this, my favorite, uh, when Johnny comes marching home mm -hmm. again. <laughs> we can do that. Okay. Uh, but I have to tell you the story first. Okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Every song has a story. This song also was, was spawned by the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that Gettysburg and Vicksburg, right back to back, the first four days of July 1863, a lot of people north and south thought with these two huge Union victories, this could possibly be the end of the Civil War. So people north and south began watching the newspapers. Now there was a young lady by the name of Annie Gilmore. Annie was 18 years old, living in Boston, Massachusetts. Annie was an Irish immigrant. She had come to the United States in 1851 with her family and her older brother, a gentleman by the name of Patrick Gilmore. Back in Ireland, Patrick was known as one of the very best brass band arrangers, conductors, and horn players in the entire country. When they arrived in the United States in Boston, it didn't take Patrick very long to establish himself in the very same vein in Boston and in the state of Massachusetts. When the war began, the state of Massachusetts asked him to be their bandmaster, to write all the regimental arrangements for the regimental bands from the state of Massachusetts, and he agreed to do so. Annie, in July of 1863, was engaged to Captain John O'Rourke of the Union Army, and Annie truly thought the war was going to be over any day. She was watching the newspapers. She went to her older brother and said, would you write a song for John when he comes home from the war? Patrick Gilmore had an excellent knowledge of Irish folk songs. He selected one called Johnny We Hardly Knew Ya, written in 1810. He took that melody, changed it a little bit, wrote new words, and invented When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again. It was published September 23, 1863. Very quickly became one of the most popular songs of the Confederate Army. They were called Johnny Rebs, and we were called Billy Yanks. By the end of the war, it was one of the most popular songs north and south, and it remains one of the biggest hits of the Civil War. After the war, Patrick Gilmore had Gilmore's Brass Band. It was on tour. It was, they did world tours. It was all over the United States. Very, very, very popular brass band. Patrick Gilmore's entire career was eclipsed by a kid born in 1854 in Washington, D.C., who was taught to play the violin at the age of six, his father was a trombone player in the Marine Corps band, and his name was John Philip Sousa. Mm -hmm. And he was more impressed with the regimental bands than he was with his old violin. So his father bought him a French horn. By the time Sousa was 25, he was the bandmaster of the Marine Corps band, and he went on to become one of the most uh, popular brass band arrangers you've ever heard. He could, nobody knows Patrick Gilmore because of John Philip Sousa. <laughs> now, back to John and Annie. This guy had cold feet. They did not get married for another 12 years. They got married in 1875. <laughs> no idea what was going on there. They wound up in a small town in, in uh, Nebraska called Plattsburgh, Nebraska. John served in local politics. He was a postmaster there. They had no children. Their house today that they lived in is on the National Register of Historic Places as the home of the couple that inspired this famous Civil War song. So, when Johnny comes marching home again. It's a minor chord. You hear that when the bad guy walks in the center. <laughs> <laughs> and Johnny comes marching home again. Hurrah, hurrah. We'll give him a hearty welcome and hurrah, hurrah. But then we'll cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies say we'll all turn out. We'll feel gay when Johnny comes marching home.
of you two getting together and developing this is a very nice story. Would you care to maybe share that? I think you've always played that, have you not? No, I have not. No. <laughs> and it probably shows. <laughs> yes, I've known each other for almost 15 years. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, 2014, I used to have guys come over to the house. We had big bluegrass, folk music, sometimes Civil War music jam sessions. Lisa is an excellent piano player, but you can't play you know, the piano with violins and mandolins and banjos. So, uh, all the guys left one night, and she said, you know, I'm gonna learn to play something, because I wanna, I wanna play along with you guys. I wanna learn to play the mandolin. I said, no, you don't wanna learn to play that, that's hard. Learn to play the bass. You always need a bass player. I owned this thing for many years. I played it in several bands, and I never, never, I've never had a lesson, so I taught myself how to play that thing, and I showed her how to play her own as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, is a, uh, she can read music, she knows music theory, all that stuff. She bought a fingerboard chart for it. And I would leave a lot of times before she got home from work to go play someplace, and she had my very first CD of Civil War music. She knew what key every song was in, so she put that on the CD player and played along with it. And before I knew it, probably it probably took her about six months, she played along with everything. Let me just finish here. So, then we, <laughs> so this is my favorite part of the story. So we, you know, I'm practicing while he's gone, he doesn't know what I've done, but I've learned all Civil War songs, right? All Civil War songs from his CDs. So he, you know, we plan the next jam session and we, you know, I cook, I clean, I get ready. I'm super excited to play the bass with the guys and, and uh, they start playing and they start playing cowboy songs. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. That was a part of how this kind of stuff. I'm like, I don't know what I'm to So I sat and I sat. Finally, the song that broke free was We Are Coming Father Abraham. I'm like, I got this. So uh, anyway, so it, it was, it was my only intent was to play at home. I, I, that was it. I just wanted to play with the guys because it's just, I love music and I knew what they were talking about. Play Dixie in the key of A or play it in G. And, and so I, I could understand that, but I couldn't play. The piano was too chunky with it. So but anyway, that's my part. You may continue now. <laughs> I also do a program on Stephen Foster, Cradle to Graves and his career. And I had a gig on a Friday night to do the Stephen Foster program. So. Of course, you know, before you play for one hour, you practice five or six. So anyway, I'm practicing my Stephen Foster program. She's playing along, and she's singing harmony with me. Uh, well, that sounds a lot better than what I'm doing. So <laughs> I told her she was now officially in the band. And it's amazing. She had never sung into a microphone before, never played in front of people before. But that Friday night, she played in front of 120 people and never missed a note. And I thought, if she's that good, I'd better marry her. Yeah. <laughs> and now we know why I tried to play the bass. <laughs> so good bass players are hard to find. So that's, yeah. that's how we wound up getting together.